morning. And thank you everyone for joining us for this year's Ahmad Tarani Symposium. I'm JG, faculty in the department and member of the Lectures and Exhibitions Committee. Before I say a few words about this evening's event, I'd like to begin, as we have all our architecture events beginning this fall, with a land acknowledgement. MIT acknowledges indigenous peoples as the traditional stewards of the land and the enduring relationship that exists between them and their traditional territories. The land on which we sit is the traditional unceded territory of the Wampanoag Nation. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced occupation of their territory, and we honor and respect the many diverse indigenous people connected to this land on which we gather from time immemorial. So thank you all again for being here tonight for the sixth Ahmad Tarani Symposium, which was created by former department head Nader Tarani in honor of his father. The annual symposium fosters intensive discussions that speak to issues across disciplines, framing acts of design from different perspectives. And tonight's conversation will be no exception as we are delighted to host Matthias Sauerbruck and Louisa Hutton in conversation with Mark Wigley. And now I would like to introduce Associate Professor Jay Yolande Daniels, current head of the Lectures and Exhibitions Committee, who will say more about our guests and the topic of tonight's discussion. Thank you, Jay. Um, okay. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's guests, the architects Sauerbruck and Hutton from Berlin. Uh, Matthias Sauerbruck is a founding member of the German Sustainable Building Council and a member of the Urban Design Council in Munich. He is on the board of the KW Institute for Contemporary Art Berlin. Matthias is an honorary fellow of the American Institute of Architects and he was the director of the architecture section of the Academy der Kunst Berlin. Matthias has taught at the Architectural Association in London as a unit master, and he has held tenure professorships at the TU Berlin, as well as the Academy of Fine Arts in Stuttgart. Um, he was a visiting professor at the University of Virginia and Harvard University uh, Graduate School of Design, and the University of the Arts in Berlin. Matthias studied architecture at the Hochschule der Kunst Berlin, and the Architectural Association in London. Louisa Hutton is an honorary fellow of the American Institute of Architects. She was elected to become a royal Academ academician in 2014 and was subsequently awarded an OBE in 2015 for her contribution to architecture. Louisa was a member of the curatorial board of the Schelling Architecture Foundation for 13 years and a commissioner at CABE, C-A-B-E, as well as a member of the first steering committee for Germany's Bundesstiftung. Bundesstiftung Baukultur. Ba Baukultur. Basically similar to CABE. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Luisa. <laughs> I was trying to be careful for those tough German words. Yeah. But anyway, Louisa has uh, taught at the Architectural Association and was a visiting professor at Harvard Graduate School of Design. Louisa studied architecture at the University of Bristol and at the Architectural Association in London. And we are extremely excited to have you both here. Thank you for coming. Uh, Matthias uh, Sauerbruck and Louisa Hutton have chosen to have a conversation with Mark Wigley, um, who I'll introduce now. Uh, Mark is a professor and dean emeritus at Columbia uh, University Graduate School of Architecture, Preservation and Planning. He served as dean from 2004 to 2014. He was my dean from 2004 to 2011. Um, Mark has written extensively on the theory of practice of architecture and is the author of Constance New Bab Babylon, The Hyper Architecture of Desire, White Walls, Designer Dresses, The Fashioning of Modern Architecture, and The Architecture of De Deconstruction, Derrida's Haunt. He co-edited the Ar 
activist drawing, retracing situationist architectures from Constance New Babylon to beyond. And in 2015, he co-founded Volume Magazine with Rem Koolhaas and Ole Bauman as a collaborative project by Arkees in Amsterdam, AMO Rotterdam, C-Lab, Columbia University. Mark also curated the exhibition Deconstructivist Architecture at the Museum of Modern Art and others at the Drawing Center in New York, the Canadian Center for Architecture in Montreal, and Witt de Witt Museum in Rotterdam. Uh, now I'd like to welcome Matthias Sauerbrock and Louisa Hutton to the lectern. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Yolanda, for the kind in introduction. Um, thank you very much to MIT for um, hosting us so generously. Thank you, Mark, for coming from New York, especially for the event. Um, uh, we feel very honored and hope um, we can meet your expectations and kind of explain the critical practice of Sauerbruchaken within the next 40 minutes <laughs> of time. Um, we, we normally, um, if we lecture, we normally lecture by one or the other. And, uh, but for tonight, we've kind of uh, decided to try and do something together. And we're sort of <laughs> simulating a kind of work relationship, if you like, in that we're sort of playing ping pong. So one, you know, uh, bringing up a, a subject, the other one the next. Um, and uh, hopefully we can show you um, how we work and how we think. I mean, we, the reflection of uh, what we do comes both from, of course, um, dialogue within the office, but also uh, the profession, uh, but then also kind of to a large extent, uh, basically from the experience that we gain through um, practicing. So. Um, in the last two and a half years, there are two products, if you like, or things that we've uh, curated. And they're going to, in a way, form the framework for this talk. The first um, was an exhibition called Draw, Love, Build um, that was held in Mestre, which is on the mainland, the sort of vis-a-vis -vis Venice. It's like the alter ego of Venice. It was the delivery uh, city for Venice. Um, very nice, lovely, ordinary Italian city. And uh, the second thing that we created was, um, so that, that, that we curated during the, the pandemic and opened the exhibition in um, September 21, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the uh, German magazine called Baumeister, they, each year they invite in June uh, uh, an issue to be delivered in June, and they invite uh, architects to curate it. And we did this within about four months at the beginning of this year in 22. So it's roughly one year later. And um, I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, the title of the magazine um, of Baumeister, we called The Aesthetics of the Bauwender. And I'll come on to that in a minute, what, what we're trying to mean by that. So uh, next slide. Um, the, as I said, the exhibition Draw, Love, Build was uh, located in, uh, in Mestre, in fact, in a building that we had designed a, few, a couple of years beforehand called M9, uh, the Museum of uh, Novecento or the 20th Century History, which has a top floor um, devoted to temporary exhibition spaces of about 9,000 square feet. Uh, this is a slide obviously taken in Venice. Um, and uh, we used the exhibition to think about our work over the last more than 30 years, or basically 33 years, so it's really a retrospective. Um, and we, we use the terms draw, love, and build in a way, I mean, one can use them possibly interchangeably in what I'm about to say, but we use the word draw to represent the conceptualization of architecture, in particular, its relationship to the city and the urban context. Um, and uh, we use the word uh, love to uh, denote the, the care for people, for things, for the environment. You could sum this up in the word sustainability, the care for, 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 the, uh, for future generations and the sustainability of buildings in particular. And this has been a theme which we will come on to 
uh, that's followed us since we started our practice in 1989, before many of you were born. Um, and the, the word build we um, use for actually the stuff of architecture to refer to the physical, sensual uh, matter that we perceive through our senses. And so it brings up questions of um, aesthetics in general, and in our case in particular, the use of color in combination with various um, uh, materialities. So in fact, when we had conceived this exhibition, something happened in Germany which was really, really uh, dramatic. Things have been happening dramatically in terms of weather disasters all over the world in the past two years, and they seem to be increasing in intensity. And it was in the valley of Kreuzberg and der Ahr in July, the, the, the town literally collapsed into the water. People lost their lives, their livelihoods, buildings were destroyed. And so this calls upon one to, well, obviously the urgency of issues of sustainability became more urgent, more increased. The urgency was highlighted that had already been highlighted, let's say, by the pandemic that we all are still going through, but that started in on the Ides of March 2020. And somehow this brings into question, and hence the title of the talk being L'Esprit, 21st century calls into question everything that uh, modernism really stood for, um, uh, encapsulated here in the Pavilion de, de l'Esprit Nouveau uh, by Corb in Paris in 1925. So really, one really we need to think architecture from the beginning up, as indeed the modernists did. So we see it as a parallel moment in time to rethink what we're doing. Um, with the Baumeister project, we, we arranged many uh, photographs and images on a huge long wall in our offices. In our office, this is just obviously a digital version of that. The wall was white, not black. And we then uh, collated them into various uh, themes, such as adaptive reuse or renewable materials for construction or climatomorphic architecture, etc and began to uh, try and thematize the, um, these images and the ideas they stood for in architecture and urbanism. Uh, and in parallel, actually, we commissioned people to write essays, which run the, 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 the book has a horizontal flow of uh, images and a vertical flow of essays. Anyway, you'll see that uh, hopefully in the library, or we'll send you another copy. Um, but basically, I'm going to use these two uh, things that we curated to, we're going to use it together for the structure of this talk. So we're first of all gonna talk about themes that come under the, the heading of draw or conception, and then a lot of love, and then at the end we talk about uh, build. So um, if we kind of start to think about building in these, um, in these times and these conditions, obviously, uh, the context um, is sort of one of the first um, uh, questions to maybe ask, and this may not be particularly uh, surprising for Americans, but for uh, Europeans, I think it's been become very clear um, at the beginning of this new century that um, we're living in a sort of continuous city, if you like, a continuous sprawl. I mean, Europe more and more is being covered by this network of um, particularly systems of mobility, but also all other kind of systems of infrastructure, uh, including uh, those of tourism and leisure, and uh, uh, but also in an increasingly now, and I think this is going to become more uh, <clears throat> by installations of um, of uh, renewable energy um, uh, that needs to be harvested uh, to replace obviously fossil fuels um, that um, we want to um, try to get, uh, to try to live without. Um, <clears throat> these uh, these uh, installations have become large pieces of, um, of architecture, if you like, um, that is defining the built uh, and partially also natural environment that we inhabit and placing, adding kind of uh, structures to this, um, to this sort of network, um, somehow doesn't um, have to respond only to the kind of classical conditions of, um, of the European city of, uh, you know, urban spaces, but it's, it's actually uh, responding to um, this kind of network. So, I mean, this is an example of, 
a building that we built in Hamburg um, that very visibly responds very differently to two different sides. One side is very much to do with pedestrians and bicyclists and so on, it's a kind of small park, and the other side is uh, facing um, a relatively dense piece of um, railway infrastructure. And obviously the building is sort of trying to straddle this um, situation. So the, what I'm trying to say is maybe kind of well represented in this drawing by Leonardo Benevolo, the famous uh, author of the history of the city, um, <coughs> uh, trying to represent the Veneto, the area around Venice. It's this um, area which the Italians call Trepave, tre which is Treviso, Padua, and Veneto, this kind of triangle. Uh, which is an area in which a very large part of the GDP uh, of uh, Italy is being produced, very um, sort of industrial and very typically Italian kind of specialist uh, sort of manufacturing mostly. Um, and you can see on this map here beautifully the, the, the kind of the way the, the infrastructural networks have been um, covering the landscape. It starts off with the Roman land division. You can still see the squares. Um, that you know existed in the whole Roman Empire in principle, rather similar to Jeffersonian land division. Uh, then there's kind of systems of canals, there's a system of, of roads uh, increasing in size. Um, now kind of major motorways hitting Venice uh, and also kind of train lines, uh, including the high speed Italian high speed train, plus an airport which is probably uh, one of the, or if not the most um, uh, busy airport in, uh, in Italy, at least. Um, and the question, in a way, is now, you know, how do we, if we introduce architectural intervention into this sort of system, into this kind of city, um, how, what's, what are the rules? I mean, what are we aiming for? Um, so continuing with the theme of draw, really cities are obviously for living. and. Uh, so if my mind is designing a, a building within this network that Matthias has described, one needs to think not only of spaces inside the building itself, but also the, buildings the spaces around the building. I mean, this is very uh, obvious, but needs saying. And we have a historical example here of the Kulturhuset in uh, Stockholm, um, designed in the late 50s, early 60s, that itself was the um, predecessor, if you like, of the Pompidou, which we all know uh, very well, which was the, uh, celebrated its 50th anniversary just recently, which is very touching somehow. And you can see the care with which the, you know, it's almost like an urban carpet, this exterior space on a lower level to the main circulation of buses and cars to invite people into the Couture Hosset, this cultural center and, and library on, on a lower level. And in fact, indeed, the entrance has recently been uh, rejigged to, to the lower level from the upper level. But anyway, it's a lovely, I think it's a fantastic image and it's a very beautiful project for anyone visiting Stockholm. And then the next slide is showing, uh, Again, well-known projects, so the top two are historical, the Pompidou, obviously, top right, but before that, the uh, beautiful Masper or Museum of Sao Paulo, designed by Lina Bobardi um, in the 60s, and there, of course, in Brazil, one needs external space to be highly shaded, so for her, the external space is underneath the building. She does this huge, expressive uh, uh, um, U-shaped uh, beams which are carrying, suspending the two floors of the museum and allows people to gather underneath. There are many fantastic photographs of crowds of people underneath, whether on demonstrations or not. And of course, the Pompidou Center, you all know very well where the square in front that was cleared at the same time from uh, the, the, the historic city of Paris serves beautifully to address the building. It's actually very slightly sloped. It works fantastically. Um, obviously addressing the uh, escalators in particular. And then on the bottom right is the project of Snow Hetter, finished a few years ago in um, uh, uh, Oslo of the fantastic um, opera house where they invite people to promenade on the roof of this building. Even if they're not visiting the building, they can promenade and see their own city in a new way. So it's a very much a deliberate uh, emphasis on um, public space. Um, an example from ourselves is again this museum in Mestre that we uh, conceived about 12 years ago and completed about three years ago. On the left is the, an aerial photograph of the condition of the building and, and the district as we found it at the time with a, uh, an, an abandoned monastery in the middle left of the slide. 
and, on the, and some uh, buildings, some of which had been knocked down actually by the time we arrived uh, in the middle center of the slide and, and below the monastery. And uh, on the right-hand side, you can see a, a rendering of, of the main idea with which we won the competition, which is, again, an idea of public space. And it's of bringing people through the site from the southern, southeastern corner to the northwestern corner through a newly created public route that we achieved by dividing the museum mass into two and then through the, uh, the, 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 the former uh, convento and through up to the public square of Piazza Ferretto on the top of the slide um, and allowing east-west routes through as well. So this is a, a freehand sketch showing um, that movement, the public space, the movement diagonally through the site, through the convento where you see columns which we'll come on to later. And also it incorporates the ground floor activities of the museum, such as the auditorium or the foyer, the bookshop and the restaurant and the sort of media lounge that are very much part of the exterior public space. So it's again this sort of meshing of exterior and interior. And here's a view from that south uh, eastern corner walking up towards the old convent and the uh, perspective as you see is exaggerated by both the form of the building and the laying of the ceramic tiles to increase the dynamic of the, uh, of the route. Um, <clears throat> here we have a view inside from that more or less the same point actually uh, of uh, the auditorium and as you can see at night time or even during the daytime passers by can look through glass windows on both sides of the auditorium which is like a continuous landscape from the foyer, a timber landscape of of seats and see what's going on. They can see the projections very well, so you can basically uh, enjoy the event uh, even if you don't hear all the words that are spoken. But we very much like this aspect of relating to the outside. And when we gave a lecture there recently, it was really charming to see people um, looking in. And in fact, one could hear a bit of the outside world. It was a very nice uh, experience. And here is the view through the, through the monastery, through the courtyard where we've uh, designed a roof that doesn't touch the old building but enables this um, public space to be used in a way that's different to the main piazza which of course is much larger and open air but here we control the environment it's acoustically controlled by a double layered um, ETFE roof and of course the rain is kept out and the sun is kept out and it allows informal uh, gatherings so we like the idea that the program of the museum brings together uh, spaces as a social mode um, with the imported program of the auditorium and the obviously the temporary exhibition, the permanent exhibition and the bookshop and the restaurant and all of those. But at the same time, we m made sure that there were spaces that were suitable for spontaneous gatherings such as these um, and therefore somehow reinforce the public life of the city. The museum is very much for the Mestrini, for the people who live there and not necessarily for tourists but also, of course. So it's nice to really work with the city. So if this, um, in a way, was trying to exemplify the need and the potential of creating, um, say, social um, condensations within this kind of network of, uh, of, of infrastructures, um, and I'd like to come to an aspect that is, is becoming more and more relevant as climate change is, um, is gaining tracks, gaining speed, so to say. Um, the, the, the fact that um, most of the, um, in, in urban contexts at least, and this is largely uh, almost everything of Europe, um, the, the ground is being covered through some sort of roads or infrastructures or, or buildings or whatever. And we're losing uh, an enormous amount of um, biotopes and, and species, actually, as, as well as an opportunity to kind of um, for for the ground to to um, influence the the climate and um, creating heat islands, heat island effects, which have become rather deadly in the last uh, decades. Um, Paris had, I think, in '98 or something, or was it yeah, around the around the turn of the century, had one summer where they had an excessive um, amount of um, death as a consequence of uh, continued heat. Uh, the city was just not cooling down anymore overnight. And so, I mean, this is something that will, will be, incre will be um, uh, experiencing increasingly. So um, these are examples which you're obviously uh, well aware of the High Line and other kind of infra industrial infrastructures uh, that 
have been transformed that are lying fallow and they have been reused in other ways and have been also been reused to, as an opportunity to unseal surfaces or create unsealed surfaces. And this is something that we'll, we will have to do with or we will want to do with our kind of um, uh, roads, I mean city roads. I think that the, uh, the kind of space that's being taken up by cars is obviously um, excessive and should be reduced and so the opportunity for other activities in the street should become possible again. And of course it could also go up and it will go up um, the buildings and so it's not just the horizontal surfaces that should be unsealed but also the vertical ones. This is obviously Stefano Boeri's example in uh, Milano, the Bosco Verticale and Milano it is a traditional, the other pictures, a traditional uh, building in Milan. They have a lot of roof gardens there already. So, I mean, that's one way of de dealing with it. But, I mean, this attempt to integrate nature into buildings this leads almost to a reversal of this archetypal condition that the Abbe Logier was imagining, um, that um, nature would be trained to become architecture, you know, by turning it into roof and column and so on. It's now almost the reverse in that we are trying to, to turn the kind of prismatic presence of buildings into something that resembles nature. And we have just finished a building that is uh, try attempting this for the first time for us um, in Geneva. And unfortunately, the plants haven't quite grown yet, so I will have to be a bit patient. <laughs> but, uh, it's a it's a, it's a building for uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, the, the uh, charitable um, organization of emergency medical services going around the world. And they have a very kind of dynamic, very um, untypical office um, setup, which the building is trying to reflect. But I mean, that's something for another lecture. And then another theme of our love is uh, climatomorphic architecture by which I mean architecture whose uh, form predominantly, but also the surfaces and the skin, are um, evolved and conceived uh, in response to uh, the climate and the conditions of our environment, and also are done, in a way, done so in a way that are, uh, let's say, demonstrative, because I think it's interesting to produce an architecture that's, um, I suppose one could say didactic, but anyway, is uh, referring to the conditions of its production and helps people understand why it is the way it is. Um, so, uh, yeah, here are some uh, historical examples of, on the top right, Kirby Hall, so um, Elizabethan house in England, in, well, so we're here in the sort of uh, northern climate, where to, to, to the southwestern facade, in a later addition to the house, the enjoyment of sun coming in, of sun ingress, is really expressed and made so you get the warmth of sun coming into these huge drawing rooms and the rooms above on the, on the first floor. Um, you get the warmth of the sun, the enjoyment of the heat and the light and the views. So it says so somehow, I think it's very beautiful because the normal, the facades at the time were more, uh, the windows areas were not so um, expansive. And there's the uh, sanatorium of Doika, I think it is, um, on the left-hand side, which is again where in the, uh, the, the spread of tuberculosis in the early 20th century led to a lot of architecture to bring in light and air and sun and to help people uh, get better all, all over uh, Europe, particularly in Northern Europe. Um, so you see this pavilion which is really embracing the sun. And another example is the Girasole in Italy where the whole building is, is, is a, a quarter circle like a piece of cake and it literally rotated. I think it's, we, you know, it's the most poetic project where one, the building would rotate according to the sun like a sunflower and one would enjoy the sun coming in on the bre for the breakfast or lunch or dinner or whatever. It, it's just amazing, um, still visitable today. And on the next slide, we can see then, obviously, then, as in now, it becomes more imperative to actually find ways to keep the sun out, because we don't want the sun um, all the time. So the ideas of uh, flexible shading from Aspelon, bottom left, or Jean Nouvel with his Institut du Monde Arabe on the right, traditional shading in a European street in the center, and um, a project by a colleague, at the Stamp Size Project. Um, so uh, this project is really to do with global injustice, and it shows, well, you can read a thin horizontal line with some words on the right-hand side, and the words 
well, you can probably read it, but the world average biocapacity per person was um, 1.7 GH. Global hectares. Global hectares, sorry, in 2010. The slide is actually from 2014, but obviously the situation has likely got worse in the past eight years. You can see America is, is here on the left, Germany not far behind. And the obvious thing that's happening is that the rich countries, the Western countries, are really using the credit of uh, the developing ones, and the developing ones themselves are developing fast, according you know, to what they've learned from us, of capitalism and everything. So it's a bit of a, obviously a disaster situation that I wanted to highlight with uh, this image. And the, the next one shows another aspect of uh, sun ingress, and in this case with projects by the well-known French practice Lacton Vassal, who often on existing buildings on the top two left slides, they add a layer onto these huge uh, housing projects that, that were conceived and constructed in the late 60s, early 70s, really uh, giving the inhabitants another room, a completely glazed room with curtains so they can reverse the amount of sun and light and increasing the floor area by up to 25% per living unit and really increasing the capacity of um, enjoyable living. I mean, they're really fantastic projects. Or the, the lower one is adding effectively a greenhouse to um, a normal house, but really using, uh, creating buffer zones that accept and use the warmth of the sun. And here's a project of ours, one of our early projects that I was already mentioned, the GSW project, which is a tower, an existing, a, a, a slab, here's the new slab added to an existing tower, which you can't see in this photograph, where there's a summer condition and a winter condition. And in fact, there is a, a thermal flue, which is a, a space about three foot, four inches uh, wide or a meter deep, running for the whole height and width of the facade, which um, draws air through the facade because it's on the west, so it warms up. So the air is drawn up, as you can see on this simulation by Arab, the engineers who worked with us, which means that the, um, you can, because the air is moving up, if you open a window on the eastern side and a little window into the thermal flue on the west, you can get a very gentle draft uh, through the building. So it was very unusual at the time, it still is quite unusual to try and achieve natural ventilation in a tower, as, as you can um, appreciate. And what we like about the result of the architecture for this is that we show the, the building has two different dresses, let's say, for the winter and the summer, and all the, the days and seasons in between. So in the summer, obviously, the shutters in this thermal flue tend to be shut by the inhabitants, and in the winter open to let the sun in, to let the warmth in, to let the light in. So the building is a, is a sort of dynamic urban painting that reflects the desires of its inhabitants. Um, <clears throat> and the next image is to do with wind and wind catchers uh, in, the, in the Middle East, where you see the wind is, is captured and brought down into the buildings, a little project uh, by Peter Salter, a competition project in uh, Scotland on the right, or a beautiful project by Svi Hecker in a uh, city to the north of um, Jaffa, which itself is to the north of uh, Tel Aviv, where the t it, for the town hall he has uh, these uh, wind catchers on the roof which draw natural ventilation through the building and obviously cooling it down. But uh, we, uh, we love the sculptural intention and result of this. I think it's very uh, poetic. Um, a building of ours in Frankfurt, which, similar to the GSW one, is lower than GSW. It's only 14 stories, so here it's not a high-rise. We think of it as a high-rise in Europe, but it's a mid-rise, I guess. And uh, instead of having a thermal flue, as we do on GSW, to uh, induce the air current, um, here there's a, a great... Uh, proclivity of the wind to always come from the southwest, as you can see in the little plan diagrams with the red bulge on the southwest. And then because the wind we introduce into the double facade through movable flaps, we get a negative pressure at the northeast, and this draws air through the double, double facade. So if you open the window of the office into the double facade, um, you can ventilate your office without your papers flying around. And of course, it copes with various wind and sun uh, conditions. And again, we use the, um, the fact of the building having this so-called pressuring to design the character, the form, the look, the color, and the materials of the architecture. So it's sort of, is, it looks like what it's doing. You know, it's a, it's a building to do with uh, wind-driven natural ventilation. 
And here, back to Mestre and the courtyard, the, the sort of folding roof is also very much to do with collecting the rainwater and expressing the collection of rainwater that comes down into systems. And there's a balanced system with the uh, river uh, nearby in the neighboring street. Um, so uh, the collection of rain, obviously, in, even in Roman times or other uh, cultures, as in the bottom right in, in India, but rain is very valuable and is often collected, and we love it, to, love to see it being collected and loved and expressed as part of the um, architecture, both with the sound of rain, but also seeing the reflections in the shallow pools. Luisa has been showing this uh, this graph of the um, the footprints of the different nations in the world, and it is very eloquent of um, telling us that. Basically, we have to reduce our footprints no matter what. And obviously, um, uh, uh, the, the avoidance of fossil energies is a kind of key issue. So um, as architects and who are part of the construction sector, and the construction sector is about responsible for about 50% of um, the footprint in our societies in, in, in Europe, um, we, we definitely are sitting on a lever to kind of try and contribute to this reduction of, um, of carbon. Um, and we have to find ways of integrating um, uh, renewable kind of energy sources into our buildings. And like Luisa was explaining of the kind of response to the climate, turn it into a kind of aesthetic and architectural um, benefit rather than a kind of duty that needs to be somehow um, uh, be done. So this is an environmental, the environmental agency which we've done in 2005, which um, has a large um, solar collecting um, uh, roof actually, sun collecting roof, and, uh, and there's also an extensive um, heat exchange system in the ground where air is being pulled through the ground and uh, it's being preconditioned before it gets into the interior of the building. Um, so in the summer, um, it's, the ground is cooler, so it's cooling the air in the summer. In the winter, it's the opposite. And here are just examples from colleagues. There are not historic, there are no historic precedents for this. Um, uh, for This is by Big, I think a Google or something a facility in Southern California, which is, has these kind of solar sh uh, shingles, which I think is quite an interesting way of integrating. Um, the need of um, uh, solar harvest, and at the bottom left is a project in Germany where the solar panels are integrated into facade. I think it's still very much at the beginning, this field, because it's, uh, in more cases than not, it kind of really looks like a technical device that's being somehow mounted to the building, which is um, maybe not what one necessarily wants. We, we try to integrate um, wind generators in buildings in, in two instances, where this is in Copenhagen and this is in Oslo. Um, but in each case, this is still, projects didn't come to fruition. Although this particular one, I mean, the whole building was kind of uh, designed to respond to the wind and kind of you know, turned into a wind turbine, if you like. Um, but another aspect that is kind of uh, somehow driving us on our um, on our journey, if you like, uh, in, the, um, in the exploration of sustainability um, is uh, the fact that the, the conditions um, uh, the, the in, under which we're working are rapidly changing. So, I mean, this is from the GSW project, which was completed in 1999. Um, this is what we assumed um, uh, where energy is being spent. So we, we assumed that 15, approximately 15% 15 would go into the construction and 85% uh, would go into uh, the operation of a building during its life cycle of 60 years. Um, in the meantime, the kind of uh, the legal context has changed so much and the requirements for uh, energy, um, uh, reduced energy consumptions are so, uh, have grown so much that this has almost reversed. So, I mean, there's a lot, the, the gray energy, the embedded energy, what's, uh, you know, the fact that that is, plays an important role at the beginning um, uh, of, a, of the life of a building um, has become more important than the operative um, uh, energy that's being spent on the way. This is particularly also true because uh, over 60 or longer year uh, lifetime, you cannot predict how users will be using your building and how they might be changing it, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas the, 
the, the construction and the material that actually goes into it in the first place is something that the design team can actually has relative uh, decision, relative free decision to, to, to do. And we learned this actually in, in one particular project where we converted an existing building from the 80s, extended it and uh, reused the, the concrete frame. You can see before and after. Um, and we learned, we had an engineer calculate the, the effect of this, and we learned that just keeping the concrete frame, we replaced everything else, the facades, the floors, the finishes, everything, technical equipment, and so on and so forth. But just keeping the concrete um, frame saved approximately the uh, a carbon dioxide uh, equivalent of 35 years of heating. So, I mean, you can't possibly um, uh, you know, make your heating system as efficient as to kind of bring it down to zero. So, I mean, we learned really that there's a, a big lever in what we do. So, we're running out a little bit of time here. Um, uh, I guess we're, we nearly, to, we're nearly at the end. We've just right. got two more love and a couple of build. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, in, t in terms of, yeah, we, we are hoping that with this new ecological mindset that's not only um, affecting uh, architecture and the built environment, but also many other walks of life, life of course, we're, we're, and, and it's imperative of reduction, we're hoping that architecture can, in a way, act as a sort of avant-garde for this climatic turn, or the Bauwender, as I mentioned right at the beginning, which is the German word for uh, the turn in building that is coming out of this necessity to react. And another aspect um, that's important is obviously circularity of both materials and components. And uh, while many uh, cultures have been using uh, clay and mud for, for generations, uh, as in this uh, image from the Yemen, uh, um, also, uh, contemporary architects are using and have been in the past 20 years uh, clay for buildings such as the Herzog de Moron uh, factory for, no, no, the Schaulaga, sorry, the exhibition space in Basel. And another material that's uh, very obvious is and easily grows is bamboo, which the Richard Rogers uh, partnership used for the beautiful Barajas airport, the terminal, additional terminal in uh, Madrid. She used. Uh, and... Um, uh, on the right-hand side, a pavilion that was made uh, recently for the, the architecture biennale uh, curated by Hashim Sarkis. This was a pavilion erected on the uh, island of San Giorgio. Um, and the most obvious material, of course, with, which will, uh, I think, come to dominate uh, architecture in coming decades is timber. Here we have an example of the both slides refer to a project in... Uh, Sweden, no? Mm -hmm. Yep. Sweden by White Architect, where actually a former colleague of ours is working for a social center. And I think one can see on the interior that they're using a, a very nice combination of um, steel and timber to create a kind of lightness in terms of the, the beams that are spanning over this um, public hall and this housing above. So, you know, even uh, small high rises in, in Europe are being constructed in timber. I'm not sure about the States. I presume one is trying that as well. I'm not sure. And a project that we built some time ago is, is not a high rise at all. It's a very simple church in Cologne where we used uh, timber in a prefabricated method as frames. Um, and the entire body of the church, both inside and out, is made of timber. The only thing that's not timber is the floor, which is concrete. Even the screen at the end behind which is the organ is made in painted timber. Um, and in fact, although this church is not intended to be disassembled, it very e easily could be. And this idea of disassembly, of assembling and disassemble, is very important when one's talking about materials and components, because uh, in a lot of architecture, things are tied together uh, sort of forever. And now one has to think of joining um, components in a different way so that they can be taken apart and recycled. Um, and we see the church in a way similar to the Mestre project as a place for, uh, well, formal gathering in terms of church services for this Protestant congregation, but also more informal gatherings. As you can see on the right, there's a, a music evening with everybody coming and contributing. And it was somehow very charming for us that such a simple building can really act as a galvanizing social spirit in this um, small congregation. 
And in terms of design for disassembly, on the left there's a typical example of a prefabricated house from America where, where the project really got going um, post-war of uh, designing houses in, in, in pieces and then assembling them and driving them somewhere to, for, 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 for the new uh, owners and inhabitants. And on the right is an image from the show at MoMA curated by Barry Bergdahl. Um, I always forget the title. Pre oh, home Delivery. Home Delivery, perfect title. Um, and I think this is Kieran Timberlake, or am I wrong? Anyway, uh, you're wrong. one of the projects, yeah. I'm wrong. Kaufman. Kaufman, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, it was a great exhibition, there's a great catalogue, it was a very inspiring uh, show. On the left, the famous uh, capsule or pod hotel in, in Tokyo, uh, designed by Kurokawa, which has sadly been, it has been dismantled, but at least it was dismantlable. And many uh, lucky people now own one or two of these pods. There are fantastic images of it on the net. I urge you to see it in particular of the interiors, which are totally stuffed with daily life and not as pure as this. They're really amazing images. And on the right, a housing project by Svi Hecker. Um, and bottom left, a very, very well-known example for you all here, I'm sure, is the Montreal uh, project by Moshe Sadvi, I think his first uh, project, which is very touching to go and visit because you can never buy an apartment there. Um, people can only move from within, and all, it's a very multi-generational uh, project. You can't quite see that here, but the spaces between the elements are very beautiful, and some are shared by all and some are private. But anyway, it's a lovely sort of community um, affair. Um, here are a couple of projects that we've done recently. This one is in Hamburg, where we used prefabricated uh, elements for student housing, which are mounted on top of a concrete table uh, raised up above the ground for three entrances and parking of bicycles and social spaces underneath, and then three lift cores in concrete. Now you can even do lift cores in timber. Um, and then the modules were delivered, the 397 modules for student housing, and the whole construction took about uh, of the modules took about three months. It was amazingly fast. And we decided in this case to make the facade an expression of the timber and so use timber, um, these timber elements to create a sort of bar relief uh, catching the side light. Uh, another project, in fact, with the same uh, timber producers or timber module producers, which is an Austrian company, where obviously in the Austrian valleys they're, they're very uh, keen on these sort of technologies that they're developing. And here the, the building was for the German parliamentarians, finished very recently, and it had to be built at great speed. And the modules were uh, actually erected in a factory in Berlin and delivered six a day for a period of, uh, I don't know, however many you divide into 400. It was incredibly fast production. In this case, we clad the building in recycled aluminum and colored glass because we wanted the colors to reflect the the, yeah, the many ideas uh, behind the individuals of a democracy, and we decided to not use timber but recycled aluminium so that the facade would last longer and need replacing less often. Now, oh, okay, is, I we'll promise continue. to be fast now. We're nearly I mean, at the end. Yeah, <laughs> it's uh, obviously uh, the next step is actually before you you, you stop building altogether, uh, you, you kind of try and reuse what what you find. Um, and uh, in this kind of uh, debate of sustainability and how, um, you know, what is actually sustainable or what's just greenwashing and so on and so forth, it's very, very difficult to, um, I mean, you can quantify things and you can also kind of make certain assumptions and you can design for certain resilience and all of those things. But ultimately, the question whether something will be sustainable or not will be decided by the next generations uh, because they will either accept the buildings or they will not accept it. So in a way, our kind of adapting existing uh, buildings and reusing them is one of those kind of uh, acceptances of previous the work of uh, previous generations and kind of trying to uh, make them last longer, create a sustainable situation. And it's uh, obviously in important buildings like churches and so on, it's something we can find all over Europe in almost every city. In contemporary um, context, it's, um, we find a lot of uh, re uh, re-articulated uh, industrial, whatever, loft buildings and so on and so forth, but I mean now also in 
you find 60s and 70s structures, like this is in Berlin, the so-called uh, Haus der Statistik, which is in Alexanderplatz. It's an ex-office building from the uh, GDR, which is now going to turn into community, a very mixed project community and all sorts of things. And at bottom right is the adaptation, the famous adaptation of Hong Kong Shanghai Bank in Hong Kong by the Philippine uh, uh, house workers who meet there on a Sunday, a Sunday afternoon and, and, and kind of use this space in a totally unpredicted way. And so we have also done projects, I mean, like this is relatively old already, it's a kind of fire station. Exist, we used an existing fragment of an institutional building and uh, there's an existing single bank condition. We just used the corridor and added rooms on the other side and kind of made it very obvious that we are adding to an historic building, and this is a similar situation with the, with the so-called Plattenbau, a kind of prefabricated concrete building of the GDR, an ex-school, which we extended, um, and timber, again, is a great material, A, because it's light, and B, um, because we could prefabricate a lot of it, and it could be done while the school was kept on operating. And here's a project that's going at the moment, an ex-office building, which has been also taken apart and it's going to be turned into a residential building. And I would like to use this as a kind of example for um, what is kind of close to our heart. I mean, we feel that uh, we feel that buildings, obviously they have to work and obviously they have to kind of somehow perform. And, uh, but at the same time, they have to develop a kind of character, an aura. They have to be uh, of a certain sensual um, or sensuous quality. Um, in exactly for that, I mean, if we, if we kind of try and imagine what buildings have been demolished and which buildings have not been demolished, um, it's obviously those that are that have a certain character, have a kind of certain quality that people would like to um, keep. Um, and so this is exactly what we're trying to do. And this is something that is, uh, strangely enough, kind of been uh, echoed by um, the German Supreme Court. Um, some young uh, people have taken the government uh, to court uh, over their negligence of the uh, climate change, uh, arguing that they are ruining, their, 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 they're neglecting the care of future generations and they were given right. So there's a kind of, um, there was a, an order issued by the Supreme Court to the government that they had to kind of do everything in their power to meet the, at least uh, the uh, Paris Climate Accord. So I mean, in a way, we are kind of trying to project into um, uh, a gener I mean, generations ahead of us and we feel that kind of taking, giving a certain, let's say, um, investment of care and love and kind of uh, also maybe intuition or, or intelligence is, is a kind of as important as it as is whatever uh, technology might be included to reduce carbon. Yeah, so just picking up on what Matthias said, it's the, the quality of the sensuous environment that we're uh, looking to uh, pursue in our buildings and um, you know, we've spoken a lot about the quantitative in terms of the, the many aspects of sustainability, but for us, it's the qualitative, the, the whole of the both exterior space and interior space that's important. So here I just have four examples. This building we've already seen, it's a drawing that we call um, kinetic polychromy, which describes, in our view, how one could experience or should experience this uh, building that Matthias already mentioned, the Munich Re, the reuse of a concrete structure where we reclad, not only we, we, we reuse the structure and the gray energy, but we, we reclad it with another skin that's more environmentally sustainable and, and uh, carbon uh, friendly, um, but worked at the same time with color to a material to try and um, induce uh, yeah, a sense of obviously identity for the building and hopefully a kind of uh, expression of love that people will identify with. Another project is uh, uh, very close to home near our office in Berlin where we designed a, a cooperative building, uh, is it called cooperative? Condominium for living and working um, on four floors and we clad it in stainless steel. So the individuality of everybody's lives is, is happening obviously behind the windows and on the outside we get this uh, reflective coat that's reflecting the surroundings, whether they're the 19th century brick buildings or, or trees or whatever. Um, 
Sorry? Let's jump. Let's jump. Uh, we can jump this one. But maybe we won't jump this one. This, this we call the city dress for Sheffield, which is this stainless steel town. You can see the stainless steel on the facade here, which is um, on this facade, uh, on the west facade, has perforations to allow air to come through without the noise of the traffic. And the ribbons actually work as chimneys to drive the air through the building and ventilate the building. But in the end, what really we really love about this building is the sort of sensuous nature and aesthetic visual nature of the facade, where the reflectivity of the stainless steel is slightly less than that of the ribbons, and you get this sort of merging, and you're not quite sure what you're looking at, but it really pulls you in to it. OK, so final slide. Um, the, we were. Um, showing this uh, or making reference to this um, uh, Pavillon d'Esprit uh, d'Esprit Nouveau by Le Corbusier and Aux Enfants. As a matter of fact, they were running together this kind of magazine with the same, uh, with the same name, um, uh, advocating uh, something um, that was that they described as purism, which one could maybe um, describe as a, as a kind of attempt to uh, reduce and concentrate uh, the, the, the aspects of real life into kind of pure forms or purer forms, that which it was also um, in a way exemplified by the furniture and so on, and the, the paintings inside of the pavilion and so on and so forth. And we think that in, in a way maybe we're at, at the moment at a kind of situation that is more or less the opposite. I, I mean, the purification, the kind of simplification of modernism maybe um, has proven to be well, maybe impossible, but also maybe not really necessary. Instead, we would like to advocate a kind of um, attitude that's maybe similar to, or has certain parallels to um, what uh, in Japanese design philosophy is being described as wabi-sabi, which is a certain acceptance of, uh, 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 of impermanence, of kind of time, of imperfection um, and uh, this kind of bowl here on the bottom right is a very good example where a broken bowl is being used to, um, or it's being repaired with gold um, uh, as a kind of embellishment, as a kind of nobilitation of the fact that it's been broken. So I mean the aesthetic comes out of the, of the kind of time, the life, the, the kind of aging of, um, of the object. And it's kind of maybe um, contradictory nature right from, um, from the beginning. So we'd like to leave it at, at this, this kind of, um, uh, with this image as a sort of maybe representation of this kind of a spirit of layering, of coexistence, of um, perfect imperfection, if you like. <laughs> so thank you for your patience. <laughs>
just left them the way they were, right? So now, presumably as an architect, you are in a relationship with these things, projects, buildings, drawings, and so on, that you love, and this word love seems important, right? And part of what you love about it is that you find yourself when doing it, because it's not so clear whether you make the project or the project makes you. And I think that the, the, in the kind of incredibly eloquent description of their work, you can see this kind of searching, not only for the, a, a certain quality of the work, but also a kind of changing sense of what would be an architect or what would be the responsibility of the architect. And I understood what was happening tonight. Maybe I'm wrong, but I understand what's happening tonight as a kind of manifesto for a kind of position that an architect could take in relationship to, for example, climate change or in relationship to certain urgencies that seem no longer avoidable. So rather than say, this is the kind of project we need, that this was an account of how one might have to think differently about, for example, sustainability uh, in order to do that. Now, I should, truth in, in advertising, say, I was born in 1956. Um, Matthias was born, I think, in 55, and Louisa in 57. So we are very tightly, uh, we, we are speaking to you from a very specific uh, brand of wheelchair or a very particular moment in time, comparing notes on the question of time because I think what's evident in, in every single project that we saw tonight was a sensitivity and an attention to time. And I think that um, when I was a student of architecture, to be interested in sustainability was to be a very ethical and virtuous person producing very uninteresting looking work. And the, the extent to which your work didn't look sensually interesting was kind of proof of your worthiness in carrying out the calculations of uh, producing a kind of energy efficient building. And what happens with this studio is that on the contrary, sustainability seems to endlessly always produce a kind of uh, delicious form of clothing. In the end, there is a kind of garment produced out of this logic, a sensuous, colorful, woven kind of fabric that is the product of um, this attention to sustainability. So sustainability in this case doesn't mean simply uh, mathematics, it is that, or kind of meeting certain uh, energy goals. It's also about making a kind of aesthetic statement. And I think that statement has to do with time, and time is weird, and architecture's relationship to time is weird. So I just want to say a couple of things about this, after which you won't want to listen to me ever again. But it would be something like this. Maybe it's easy to understand that for example, almost every architect says they try to make their work, as, as it were, fit into the site. Like, um, but of course, if, if an architect's work was, was to fit perfectly in the site, you wouldn't see it. In other words, it's not possible to experience a work that is completely immersed in its site. It's only possible to experience a, a project that doesn't fit in its site. As Marshall McLuhan used to argue, the environment we live in is exactly what we do not see. It's like water to a fish. The fish doesn't have the concept of water, but you remove the fish from the water and very quickly the fish becomes a philosopher and says, I have a concept and it's called water and I want to go back there. So presumably the environment, that which is around us, is not visible. So in fact, architects, while they may speak about fitting into the environment, precisely what they do is build, an, build a kind of exception to the environment which allows you to see the environment for the first time, what McLuhan would call an anti-environment. So he would argue that what an artist does is to put something in a situation that allows you to see the situation for the first time. If you put that into, into time, that would be to say, produces a kind of hesitation in which you stop for a moment and see what has been around you all the time. And in the moment of seeing it, you hesitate, you maybe think differently, you see differently, think differently, and therefore maybe live differently. I could have said what I just said, and I'm about to say what I just said, in terms of time, that architects always say they make things of their time, but if an architect was to make a project that was, for example, perfectly synchronized with what it means to be making, to be living uh, in October of 2022, then that work would be completely invisible. Right? You, it would not be possible for you to see it. So in a certain sense, anything that's of its time is not visible. The only thing that's visible is not of its time. So if an architect says, I would like to make a project that kind of somehow captures what is our time, what they mean is they're going to make a project that's out of sync, that it's untimely, 
but lets you, as it were, see the time for the first time. So when Louisa said, perhaps uh, architects could be, could be, as it were, part of an avant-garde, this explicitly says the architect is going to be out of time, it's going to be in the avant-garde, it's going to be in the front, in the front lines of thinking about how we might react to uh, climate change. So it seems to me it's a problem of time. What's urgent today, not tomorrow, not yesterday, but today, what's urgent is to think about what form of care we offer to those that will be living 100 years from now. So right now, we have to think about what might happen in the future. What can I make now that creates the possibility of thinking about the future? And I think this is already kind of um, um, more tricky. I suppose my general thought would be architecture is always some kind of time machine that it makes you, as it were, feel time differently. And surely we uh, not only live in different places, but we live in different times, and we live always with a different sense of time. So when Luca Rizzi and his friends build the L'Esprit Nouveau Pavilion, saying we need, need to make an architecture of the spirit of now, of the spirit of our time, the new spirit, right, L'Esprit Nouveau, uh, they don't really mean exactly, let's make an architecture of the 1920s. They mean an architecture that in the 1920s doesn't quite fit with the 1920s, but allows you to see what the 1920s is. Again, just to elaborate on that, if I insert something into the time of today, it's not going to be visible. But nothing of today could represent today. Maybe retroactively, I might think that a certain song by the Beatles perfectly captures a certain moment in the 60s. But why that song by the Beatles and not any other song? It's because that song by the Beatles was not like all the other things that were around it. So even if I could, in retrospect, think of the thing that perfectly represents its time, it would be a thing that didn't fit at that time. So in other words, the role of the architect would be something like to produce sort of untimely objects that allow one to see the time in which they were untimely, right? I know it sounds weird, but think of, for example, the project in Mestri, the M19 building, which is firstly not a building, but a kind of urban uh, reformation in which a kind of predominantly 19th century neighborhood is adjusted so that within that neighborhood, you find yourself on a new angle. I'm just quoting the architects, right? I, you're on a new angle and you encounter an object that both participates in the 19th century environment, but is also somehow odd or somehow different or a mutation seems to have landed there or is coming up out of the ground. And what is this thing? It's a museum built in the 21st century to represent the 20th century. So basically to encounter the project of the M9 Museum, you have to enter the 19th century, which has been carefully represented for you, carefully taken care of by the architects. They've allowed you to see the 19th century by modernizing it, by adding new features, new, new elements. For example, the, the monastery, you get to sort of experience it differently. So you get to feel the 19th century in order to meet the 21st century, the, the new building, which appears as a building, to go inside that building, to, which is a museum of the 20th century which in, in fact, that museum has no objects. It's like the only museum in Italy that's very proud of having no objects. So at the center of this 21st century object that sits in a 19th century neighborhood that's been reconstructed in the 21st century to be more 19th century than ever, you get to experience the 20th century, which is sort of empty. And it seems to me that th this is just to show that it is in the nature of this work to sort of layer different moments of time in order to get you to feel, as it were, time uh, somehow in motion. And perhaps there is in this work, well, there it is, you see, th there is this kind of layering um, that's going on here, which is a project that is, I would say, supremely untimely and supremely not of that place, but allows our time and that place to be, uh, to be um, thought about. So sustainability starts to sound very different from what it was when I was a student at the School of Architecture and boring work was being legitimized by, uh, by, by that. Um, I would say it even more strongly, to be committed to sustainability at that time was to be anti-aesthetic. Anti like it was understood that aesthetics itself was some kind of unsustainable crime, that beauty itself was surely superfluous to the question of uh, shelter. But with these architects, the word love is right in the middle of the, the, the uh, equation. It's funny because we were at MIT, and when it said um, 
L'Esprit 21C, I just thought, okay, that's 21 degrees centigrade. <laughs> a sort of mathematical term. And, uh, and it would be sort of in the nature of your work, like climate change would get us to 21 degrees pretty, pretty fast. But this would be the sort of story I'm telling, that these, these are architects that have been working for, for, since the office starts like in the late 80s, uh, thinking through the question of sustainability, and more and more this thinking becomes a reflection on time, and therefore it's not simply about life cycles of buildings, it is about recycling, but not recycling in the simple sense. It is, as, as Matthias pointed out, um, to sort of take account of the energy that's already existing in the existing fabric, so one could, as it were, add something to the existing fabric, which means not just keeping what's there, but adding something to what's already there, in order to produce something that would be, let's say, more sustainable, but doesn't sort of, as it were, wear its sustainability as a kind of anti uh, 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 aesthetic manifesto, quite the opposite, to wear it as a kind of um, uh, um, a, a lovable uh, um, um, uh, object. So basically my pitch would be something like, I think what's truly fascinating about this office is that it is being produced by, again I would insist that the studio is the kind of effect of this work rather than the scene in which, the site in which that work is produced. The work is producing a kind of a thinking, a thinking about time and a thinking about how, how to be untimely. And it seems to me, if now the responsibility of, of architects is thought to be to think about what kind of intervention to make today that might be relevant uh, 100 years from now, this requires, as it were, a kind of philosophical um, uh, kind of relationship to the question of time. And urgency sounds like something like, uh, okay, we have an urgent problem. You know, people are dying, waves are going, temperatures going up, and that therefore architecture arrives as a kind of uh, uh, offering, as it were, solutions. But surely the, the kind of line I'm taking here is to suggest that what architects do is produce questions, not answers. And what I see in the, in the Sauerbruck Hutton studio is a kind of questioning of what means sustainability. Of course, all the projects are totally legit in terms of making all the calculations about how much energy is being saved and so on. But more what they are doing is challenging us to, to think again about what is, the, what is the nature of sustainability and what are its uh, responsibilities. Surely if everybody started to, work the, to make work that looked exactly like their work, they would change it very fast. So the idea of this work is not simply to act as the answer or the model, but as a kind of a, 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 a provocation. If I'm supposed to be on the kind of theory side of things and they're supposed to be on the kind of design side of things, and that's the nature of the Tarani Symposium, is this kind of uh, uh, binary, I find it of course very uncomfortable because it's obvious that um, Luisa and Matthias are philosophical, are theorists in their operation. They theorize about the possible roles that architecture can play um, uh, very, very precisely. And perhaps it is just my vanity, but I would say that architects who are known as theorists or as writers are also in our imaginations, kind of as it were, designing uh, or designing possibilities. Where we are somewhat united, and I don't know if this is a generational issue or not, since our respective paths have more or less occupied that time from the mid 80s to now is a kind of reflection on this question of urgency. And, and I would say something like the combination of urgency and aesthetics. Because normally when, 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 when there's an urgent call, it's like, okay, aesthetics has to wait um, until we've sorted out the big problem. But what if the problem, what if the issue is an aesthetic issue? What if it is uh, a question of love? And I guess I want to return to that word. Maybe I'm not good with love. I know I'm not good with love. Um, but love, it seems to me, is the word you use when you want to be with someone or some situation or some place or some food or some relationship or some school or some river when you know that you're unhappy when you're not there. It's not that you're happy when you're there. You could be in your relationship totally pissed off most of the time, but you would call it love because you feel even worse when you're not in it. So you want to be with someone, someone, somewhere or someplace, but don't have a reason, don't yet have the reason to explain why. If you could explain your relationship with someone else because she or he has got a pH value of 36.3 or whatever, then no longer would the word love being used. So when these two architects use the word love as the central word for their explanation, 
They use a word that we all use when we explain wanting to be close to somebody but not knowing why. And it seems to me this is a good working definition of an architect. An architect is somebody and she doesn't know what a building is. In fact, architects are the only people in society that have no idea what a building is. Everybody else has got it all sorted out. For us, as architects, what unites us is we think buildings are mysterious, full of complications, full of questions. They're ways of thinking, they're media, they're poetic. They're, they're, we are always wondering, what is a building? Everybody else knows what a bathroom is. Humans go into bathrooms, and they pee in their shit, and then they go out. Architects go in there and forget, and <laughs> forget to do all that because the bathroom is speaking about technology, about meeting, about infrastructure, and so on. So architects are people for whom buildings are questions. Right? So what I understand from these two architects, and this is what makes them architects, is that they present sustainability as a question. Now it's an urgent question, but it seems to me it doesn't become, I'm repeating myself, less aesthetic for that. It becomes, let's say, an aesthetic project. How can one make, how can one construct, as it were, a kind of untimely aesthetic experience that will produce a kind of hes hesitation in the way we collectively discuss issues that will make it possible for, uh, let's say, an alternative way of living and of living together, by which I mean living together with other people, but with other species, with bacteria, technologies, uh, and, and, and so on. Um, and anyway, this is just a kind of fan comment, because I really like the work. I like, I like the fact that it's sort of unsettled. I adore the clouds of related projects, the affection that is shown for other architects. I love the fact that I think Conrad Vaxman's projects were sort of at the maximum distance away from any of your labels, as if you hadn't quite figured out why you love them. So I love all, particularly all the examples in your collage, which are as far away from possible from your definition, but they're there because you love them. But, you know, Cedric Price was actually more easily positioned in a, in a kind of category. So they make this kind of a field and give us a rough map of where these things are. But in a certain sense, they're also saying, these are our colleagues, these are the projects, these are, this is our environment, this is the city in which we operate. We are not yet quite ready to tell you why. We've got some thoughts, and we, in a lecture, present you those thoughts. So I very much appreciate the, this is not me like judging the uh, performance on a sort of talent show or whatever, but. Notice how the work was presented as a series of non-hierarchical points, not one of which dominated over any of the others, and even the so-called conclusion was just a kind of echo of the feeling that was in all of the other points. So this is, of course, why I like these people like this work. I don't know really what the work is about. What's even more interesting is that they don't. Right? In other words, they can tell you more about it than anyone else can tell. This work is not easy to do, but it leaves them, like it leaves us, kind of hanging there, wondering how it is that we would together think through the urgencies of our time. So I think the theory is the three of us will now solve world peace, uh, climate change, insecticide, and everything else in a kind of 20-minute conversation that I hope you will uh, participate in. But I hope you can buy into my suggestion that these are two very to say a word for, which for me is, a, is the deepest possible compliment. Very, very philosophical uh, architects. And it seems to me philosophy is absolutely a form of love. Exactly. If love is this thing that you need to be with, right, but don't know why, uh, philosophy is, of course, the side of the asking of the question, why, 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 why? And I think these architects keep, he keep saying why, why, why. Also, I like the fact that they make other architects very jealous. This has to be pointed out. Um, there is always this, this uh, quality to this work. I, for me, it's a very Gottfried Semper kind of woven. Uh, there's not, by accident, this uh, obsession, this love of color and the weaving of color. It's never one color. It's always a kind of uh, shades and spins and woven. This idea of a kind of a fabric that one could, as it were, make an object out of a, of a, uh, out of a series of reflections on new forms of responsibility towards energy, social life, and so on. The idea that it would produce a kind of uh, fabric, and following Semper, this fabric would be, in fact, what we occupy, that this is, the, this is what you occupy. And you don't have to occupy this architecture by going inside it. You occupy it just as much by simply looking at it. I'm returning to my kind of um, defense of the irresponsibility of the aesthetic, the aesthetic which, in theory, is doing no work 
in theory is kind of irresponsible, is kind of uh, slightly embarrassing. In theory, the aesthetic is t question of taste. I'm not even going to eat it. I'm just going to taste it. I'm just going to dip my tongue in it, and I'm going to throw it away. I do it without um, specificity, without uh, purpose. What if this becomes the, the great uh, urgency, to the great urgency to, to um, produce a kind of shared uh, garment that would ena enable us to gather together to think through uh, the question of urgency. Anyway, it sounded a bit pompous what I'm saying. Uh, let's let's get together and lower the tone, um, and hopefully you can join in with the with the questions. But just to say how much I love the work. Um, do we sit? We thought we'd move the chairs in. Front. Okay. Okay. You should be. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, yeah, no, no. yeah, yeah, yeah. Go oh. <laughs> so, where to begin? <laughs> well, I mean, this is uh, intense. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, um, um, I mean, I, I, I think I, I, I've at least sort of. Um, Believe to understand some of your comments um, and, and find them quite um, poignant in a way. Um, this question of time, you have already written this beautiful mm -hmm. essay in, in our turn of the century kind of um, reader kind of thing, which is where you were saying you were using the term of dancing with the, with the time. Mm -hmm. Architecture is like mm -hmm. a dance with time which uh, I find very um, appropriate uh, on several levels. Um, the, the kind of, mm, you know, the Esprit Nouveau, the, 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 it seems anyway, um, was definitely very much a kind of uh, a statement of avant-garde. I mean, this is yeah. going to be the future of architecture. Yeah. This is, you know, what we... Um, believe everybody needs and what will resolve all the problems that we have at the moment, uh, or some of them anyway. Um, <clears throat> I think ours is more, our, our attitude is more reactive in a way. I mean, we're, we're basically, we're seeing, I mean, this is the image of the kind of, of the flood. I mean, you kind of see these um, buildings basically uprooted, kind of, you know, piled onto a, um, and you kind of have a sense that, um, well, something has to change, you know, something has to be yeah. different. And it's, a, if, if you like, it's more of a reaction than, an, 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 uh, I mean, the avant-garde uh, refers maybe slightly more to behavioral patterns. I mean, yeah. because, I mean, yeah. uh, this is another issue that we are, in terms of building and so on and so forth, we, it's the kind of efforts are quite um, or relatively uh, successful. I mean, we have the carbon uh, consumption is actually slightly going down over the last sort of whatever mm -hmm. decade, but the overall is kind of steadily going up, and that's to do with lifestyle more than with actual building. So, I mean, um, this avant-garde idea was kind of trying to create maybe situations which allow you at least or invite you to live different live different lifestyles. I mean, that's, a, that's another issue which we haven't really talked about so much. Yet. But I mean, what I'm trying to say is that um, this relationship to time is a kind of complex one. It's not necessarily, mm. um, well, sometimes one, we want to be of the time. <laughs> we want, I mean, we, you know, we, like for example, when we started GSW, that was in 1991. Um, that was two years after reunification. And um, we just felt it was, there was a kind of situation in the air that this is, wow, this is it, you know, this is kind of like the future, and it's, <coughs> anything we do here has significance for the next generations, and so therefore we should think very carefully of what we're actually doing, and it should be something that marks or it comes out of this time. That, that was, at that time, was pretty much, we were sort of asking ourselves, how can you make an office building that's you know, that is as momentous as the reunification. I mean, right. how, can it be, how can it be leading the way? Uh, but now it's more, 
that you, I mean, basically, I think what has uh, somehow invaded our work is also this awareness of one's own time limit and the yeah. fact that you're actually working for future generations and that uh, basically uh, you, whatever you do will outlast you and it will somehow be interpreted by others and it mm. will, mm. You, you, you will have to lose, it's like having a child, I guess, it's sort of uh, the child yeah. will, grows up and eventually leaves um, your control, basically. Right. And this sort of awareness, uh, also in ter not just in terms of design and operation and use and so on and so forth, but also in terms of materiality and uh, detailing and so on and so forth, that's something that we've learned over the years. Um, and it's more a kind of trying to cope with this um, uh, transience, I guess, is the word, maybe, mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, but the three of us, for example, we are teachers, all of us, right? And, and it seems to me, for me anyway, when I'm with the students, I feel optimistic. Right. You feel? Right? Optimistic. Yes. yes. And excited. And um, then when I'm out of the classroom and I look at the world, I have no reason to have hope for anything. <laughs> like here we are this evening having this conversation yeah. as if the issue is not whether a nuclear war will start in the next week, right? Right. which would render this conversation slightly um, irrelevant. Yes, yes, yes. Or, or what I just said is like what you did when you showed us the destruction of that. I mean, this ab absolute disaster mm. is a frame for, for, for action. But it seems to me if, 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 we, if you look at the world there's no reason to be optimistic. So an architecture that is of our time would be horrible. It would be kept, it would be part of that. Like it, and even your, the first, that first project was a kind of social welfare housing kind of organization that eventually gets privatized and yes. becomes part of the problem, yeah. right? So, so even the optimism that you might have had at that time about that institution maybe has, was washed away by neoliberalism neo and Absolutely. so on, right? Yeah. So when you're with the school and with the students, you're thinking not what you, it's not about the conversation you're having with them now, but the ideas that they might have 20 years from now. So you sort of have that thought that they will do something in the future that will be a kind of criticism of today. Mm. So it seems to me much more interesting. Um, that's why I like the, the avant-garde comment, because it seems, I think the sort of status of the architect needs to move into a different place, occupy a different place, and not be in the present. The present is Putin, Trump, even Sweden. It's the social welfare in Sweden now. It's gone to the right, right? <laughs> Italians, you know. I mean, where are you going to look? New Zealand, like it maybe is a little little thimble of hope, but it's a thimble. It's like three million people in the bottom of nowhere. Mm -hmm. um, so, sorry for the long speech, but it seems to me what architects have as a con as as, a, as an almost a uh, congenital thing is optimism, yep. irrational yep. optimism. The architects always think that somehow things can be better and that, they, and, and that even the smallest of adjustment of a door handle could lead to a better universe, right? So mm. how do we take advantage of this optimism, which you do not find in the medical field, in the philosophical field, you don't find it anywhere in the university, mm. you, you find it it's naive, of course, and romantic. So this, this is why I love, again, this word love, because here's this romantic field that always thinks there is a way to think a better planet, a better society, um, and that requires getting out of time, like going out of now, mm -hmm. right? That's and okay. I see it, I, I, maybe it's not the way you describe the work, but I see it always um, sort of slipping out of um, accepted definitions of what, you know, you, I think I see people uh, copying your work, imitating your work, mm -hmm. because in retrospect they, re they, they can see that it catches the, the possible ways of being more... Yeah, but they <laughs> copy the result rather than the thinking, don't they? Probably. They, yeah. Uh, you would know, right? And I, li I like when in the essay you wrote, actually, you like when, when does one become an architect and you were talking today that maybe the studio is, is the effect of our architecture rather than the other way around. Yeah. I, I like these reversals that you make because I think it really is um, illuminating into how, how one is thinking. And I think this question of time and our joint uh, 
our communal age, let's say, or, you know, our, our, our generation. I think the fact that Matthias and I actually don't have children is an important aspect in our work because our buildings, I mean, it sounds kind of cheesy, but our buildings really are our children. Right. They're what we give to the world. Right. And our office is also, uh, you know, the individuals in our office in some way are our children or some of them, I mean, we're older than the grandparents of some people in our office. It's quite shocking. But, you know, <laughs> sort of, but there's this sort of continuity of thought and love that we've put into our work. And many, we've had many fantastic people in our office who've been, with us, who've been with us for over 20 years who are sort of part of this thing. But it's, um, I suppose what I'm saying is the, the aspect of time is in itself multidimensional. It's right. kind of to do with the production of architecture. It's to do with us being architects and our careers and our lives and, and with whom we interact. And the life of the product, in a way. Sorry? And the life of the product. I mean, and the life of the product, the, yeah. the projection into the future. Yeah, yeah. And... Um, I mean, we have this, uh, I don't know whether, did we, no, we maybe didn't write to you, but I mean, the GSW has been sold several times. I mean, as no. you were saying, the, the, the kind of, it was originally a social housing company, housing association, and... Uh, and it was sold by the city of uh, Berlin. It was owned by the city in the uh, uh, turn of, well, at the, around 19, uh, 20, 2010, approximately. And, uh, uh, and then since then, it's been sold and resold. It's kind of going through the uh, mm -hmm. hedge fund, but mm -hmm. I don't know what kind of financial mm -hmm. markets. And, <clears throat> and, uh, and now it's in the hands of, as we had to find out in a very laborious, laborious and circuitous way, in a, uh, in, by a kind of uh, property management company that sits in Paris, um, uh, which is basically uh, putting together uh, prop, um, real estate funds and, uh, and uh, shares them out then to their customers. So, I mean, you mm. buy mm. a share in a fund and you own, by implication, a, a little part of, say, 50 buildings or something mm, like that. Mm. And so it's this, ours is within one of those fun, uh, uh, funds and, uh, and it's being um, organized or being kind of maintained uh, or looked after by a property uh, management company which is sitting in um, Hamburg um, who have, I mean, who have, I don't know, a portfolio of, I don't know what, 200 buildings they have to look after. Anyway. To cut a long story short, they wanted to change the west facade the, um, the, 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 because the, the, these shutters are, uh, need to repair. And it needs to be it's like 20, uh, well, 23 years old now, and it sort of needs to an overhaul and so on and so forth. And they felt, uh, because it's a custom-made uh, system, they, they felt that wouldn't it be easier to go and buy something from a you know, standard catalog and kind of do something. Right. in standard colors and standard mechanisms and so on and so forth. And we started a petition against this. And, <clears throat> and as a matter of fact, talking of time, for the time being, we kind of managed to avoid, uh, uh, somehow avert this kind of uh, disaster. And because, uh, we had an, an enormous amount of support, I mean, not just from colleagues all over the world, but also the people, I mean, parts of the large parts of the population who were basically writing, you know, we want to keep this and so on and so forth. So, but anyway, so this is what happens to, what happens to your buildings, you know, you kind of put them into the world with these best intentions and you, you know, you have all these kind of uh, uh, visions of how things operate and how they, what they look like and so on and so forth. And after 20 years, you may well find um, that somebody either wants to take it down or convert it or you know, do something to it, whatever. So and that's what some people think about their children, right? That yeah. Around <laughs> about the age of 20, they start to not do what you thought <laughs> that they were going to do. But I mean, I mean, maybe I didn't say it right, but for example, the idea that um, an architect is somebody that doesn't know what a building is, is, is not a fancy thing to say. Like a painter is surely somebody that keeps painting in order to really discover why they love painting. Yeah. So it's just a kind of explanation of why you keep doing something and that you could never be uh, satisfied. You never could reach the end of that. And it, is, and it is being in this not being sure what you have done that you are the paint, you become a painter. The painter is, is not the person who, who paints, but the person who, who's sort of trying to see themselves in that moment of, you know, and so I think th th this, this kind of um, never been quite sure and keep keeping the, mm. I see that in the projects, that there is actually a lot of consistency, 
Like, I think I could spot one of your projects from a distance and say, oh yeah, that's them. I mean, probably not. You could show me some images and I wouldn't, but you can sort of feel that the thing keeps, the tricks keep getting added up and added up and added up, and they become almost, they start, the projects start to use many of the tricks from the past mm. as a kind of, particularly in mystery, you see mm. almost like a kind of, it was amazing that you made, a, you made an exhibition about, your, about all the work you've done in that building that building which seems to have in itself already all the work that you've done. <laughs> like I even think the building was part of the exhibition in yeah, a way. Yeah, it was yeah. like a one-to-one -one model. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, I, and, I, and that's a romantic idea I have about the, or what, what seems to me fascinating about architects. And I think it puts you in a different relationship to time than, than for example, Le Corbusier time. Because my spin on that would be, um, Le Corbusier and his friends were arguing that actually modern architecture arrived in the 19th century and it was steel and glass and industrialization. Yeah. And architects were too afraid of that. So finally they had to go to therapy and finally in the 20s they could deal with it. But not really deal with it, just sort of, you know, Le Corbusier's buildings couldn't fly. They t he talk a lot about airplanes, but they just sit there made of masonry and covered with stucco. So mm -hmm. it was sort of like an anesthetic against modernity. It was like, with this, you can survive speed, industrialization, alienation, calculation, and all of that. It wasn't really saying, let's go, <laughs> like, let's let it rip. Um, and it seems to me what you're saying about, about climate change, for example, is not like, let's produce something that would allow us to kind of deal with the anxiety we feel about this impending uh, disaster. It seems you're much more um, dissatisfied with what we've got at the moment in terms of dealing with that. Mm. Whereas uh, dissatisfaction doesn't seem to be Le Corbusier's thing. He was really happy with this uh, outcome. And one of the weird consequences of that is that when you look at an automobile of the 1920s, it looks really old. And when you look at a Le Corbusier building from the 20s, it still looks modern. So in other words, that weird untimeliness of that work meant that it could still be modern today because it wasn't modern even when it was done. Right? It was sort of out of sync. And, mm. and I, under, I understand you, your work as trying to actually find a possible way of engaging with the forces um, that are you know, taking us uh, towards our doom, as it were. Mm. Whereas I think that Le Corbusier was more like Offering a vaccine, like you know, here this you could you, we can we can this is a boat, and you can be in this boat and you can survive modernity. You know, it's a bit, <laughs> it'd be a rough ride, but you know, and you know he he says, okay, a house is not really a house. Uh, you get in your airplane, get into the car, the car goes into the house, you get into the ramp, you get into the furniture. Like he produced it all as a series of shifts of gear, shifts of speed. So he basically said, like architecture just fits into this series of different speeds. So you can be untraumatized by modernity. I'll, I will get you used to modernity. I don't hear that in your, in your work. There's no like, um, let's get comfortable with, with climate change. It's like, no. Mm. Let's get uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I think it's, very it's a very different, you know, in that sense, I don't see Le Corbusier as an avant-garde figure. It's an incredibly interesting figure, but I think it's much more about domesticating modernity than mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, embracing it. And, and, I, and, I, and it's, I'm not saying you're embracing like uh, the apocalypse, but, you, but you're kind of walk, walk, working your way towards it. Sort of. You know, when you show that chart, right, it's not happy days are here again. No. No. <laughs> But I do think there's hope. Yeah. yeah I mean. And I, I, th I think the fact, I mean, maybe it's also our, our condition in our office and with our age and our, or whatever, that this, um, that, yeah, their optimism stays. And I think also one is slightly unaware of aging if you don't have kids. I think if you have kids, you see them grow up and you think, oh my God, my kid's are already 40. That mean, must mean I'm whatever an old person, but if you don't have kids, I mean, I still think like I was a student. Yeah. I mean, I still think I'm a student, and I am a student because I'm still learning. Right. But it's somehow this, um, 
yeah, the time, the time dimension and the optimism in it, I think, is, um, yeah, of course, architects who have kids also work in a probably similar way, but I think in us, with us it's a different situation, or with myself, how I observe myself, yeah. anyway. But if, if, you're, if your buildings are your children, you might have more children than them, actually. <laughs> right? If you really think of your buildings as children, and the people in your office as children and so on. And I, I kept thinking of, of Alison and Peter Smithson, that you, you were also a child of, mm. of architects who thought that way. Right? So you're kind yeah. of part of a kind of a tradition of care, actually. I remember, for example, when, when Peter Smithson found out that Beatrice and I didn't have a cat. He just was in disbelief. <laughs> How could anybody live with that? It just wasn't like he was just, he just kept looking at us for like an hour. <laughs> so, so there's a certain kind of concept of what it means to live and to teach and to interact. And again, I, saw, I felt that when in, in some of your early slides when you concentrated on what they might have called the space between, like mm -hmm. you know, between these mm -hmm. objects and so on. So I think there's a kind of... Um, you're part of a kind of stream of optimism in a way which is about children, right? It is, and, and you said it exactly at the end, like um, what, had, what do you do with a building in such a way that it would be used by what, the people that are children now or something mm. in, in, the, yeah. in the future? And it seems to me that, that um, this kind of thinking about time is different. Um, on a completely different note, there is that if it's apocalypse, it's, it's kind of like, you know, if apocalypse is the, is the site, if architecture is now being produced in the, in, in this, in the face of apocalypse, right, what's, you know, what's the appropriate move? You know, like, do you make like a little nice motel <laughs> <laughs> to sort of, you know, I, th I think it's sort of, sort of like an issue. You could almost say that, almost like a design competition. <laughs> you know, if you're gonna design like the last building, what would you do? And I, I don't know. And why are we not doing that, by the way? Sorry, what was your last comment? You well, the, yeah. since they were all doomed, um, why are we not just getting ahead, just getting down and, and doing the last building? I mean, if Putin launches the bomb tomorrow, it's going to be a big, mis big mistake that as a group of architects, we didn't say, let's do the last building. Because soon it's going to be too late, right? So, yeah. in a, so in a weird way, the field of architecture, with all of its optimism, hasn't f fully tuned into this apocalypse. I would say even, I, I'd be arrogant again, I, all the discussion about the Anthropocene and climate change seems to have a lot to do with fear about the human species, not about the planet. planet which is probably going to do just fine without us. Well, yeah. We only turned up 100,000 years ago. We were like insects. We hardly even noticed that we were around. I mean, insects would go, what? What do you mean humans? Oh, yeah, there's fleshy things that were hung around for the last thousand years. So, so all this care about the planet that you find in the architecture schools around the world, like it's religion, if you're concerned about the planet, then you're a good person, obviously. But maybe not. Maybe you just really are worried about humans. Yeah, it's just so selfish. Yeah. 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 So it seems to me that I, I don't see our field, architecture, yet fully apocalyptic, like fully saying, we're fucked. Um, let's at least do a few non-stupid things uh, together. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, that would, I mean, if you, if you were really believing that, you know, there's no tomorrow, I mean, then you would kind of basically stop doing anything, no? You know, I mean, go, I don't know. go walking in a park or something like that. So. But wouldn't it, be the, wouldn't it be the other way around? Like, since we're all screwed, let's produce 10 times as much work as we did. Like, let's get on with it. Like, I mean, I really, if I, if I look at, so, so if there's a situation, like, you know, everybody that looks at the planet Earth says, oh, it's so beautiful. Nobody says, eh, it would be better if it was pink. Right? Everybody, it's just assumed that it is self-obviously perfectly beautiful, as long as we don't screw it up. Yeah. So as long as you don't, can't say that, what if, I mean, so, since we never would imagine, maybe it would be better as a cube, right? So, so just the assumption that it's just infinitely beautiful as it is, that's kind of religion. That's just not, like, not negotiable. I think somehow in architecture schools around the world, there is a sort of equally not negotiable idea that the planet needs to be saved, 
but the particular planet that they have in mind is a kind of painting, is a kind of image. It's not actually the planet that we occupy or that other insects occupy. The people that talk that way don't really care about bacteria, for example. It seems to be a much more urgent issue. So I just have the feeling like if you have a million students of architecture in the world at any one time, which we do, and a lot of them are getting serious about climate change, but not yet with that Let's get serious about that without the human at the center, right? Just let's, you know, and I, I, I'm more optimistic, I don't know, I can't explain why, but I'm more optimistic about the way the two of you are walking towards that question than how it sits in architecture schools as a default ethical mm. good thing, like I'm on the good side. But, but I mean, I, I guess the whole kind you know of Paris I mean? climate accord and so on and so forth, I mean, it's based on the uh, assumption that you, you still, there's still not Time. very much, but there's still Some room time. to maneuver. Yeah. And you, you the, the belief or the kind of narrative is that in, in a way, if you, if you manage to reduce massively um, fossil consumption and so on for and carbon dioxide production, that you, you may escape the kind of worst of the worst. So, I mean, apocalypse is not really on the menu yet. Yeah. But we, we were talking at lunch about Putin and the yeah. gas and everything, and the fact, you know, the silver lining is, is that we're all uh, caring much more about the use of energy. Right. And, you know, so that, you know, so I'm, I'm optimistic in that sense as well. I mean, everything terrible that's happening with the, the, the war and the possible nuclear situation is kind of unthinkable. But I do think that in general, a huge generalization, people are more careful about the use of energy. I mean, I'm a bit shocked here by all the lights left on in the offices in case a cleaner walks in at two in the morning or whatever. And I, I don't know, but it's um, in, in, in Europe, there's, I mean, they're gonna stop lighting the cities at night, right. which I think right. is fantastic. Right. I like darkness, right. you know. I, you know, we don't have to light everything all the time. So it, I, I think we need to review our relationship to energy and light and consumption. It, it needs a complete rethink, right. which I think is quite exciting. Right, me too. I mean, I think I, what you were saying about, I mean, um, it's not to say there's a good side to fascism or whatever, but it seems to me the, the, the fear of it seems to be accelerating interest in renewable energy right now, right? So there seems to be, we, we need to not be yeah, totally. I yeah. mean, victims people, of... So people in, take initiative. I mean, it's like they're, they're building their own PV systems onto their roofs right. and, and to have kind of a, a very small scale independence from the net and sort of, right. and that's in the middle of the city. Or, and food production, like, self-food yeah. production. Uh, there's masses of production of non-animal food and non-animal meat and things. I mean, in, in, all experimental, but it's, there's masses of it going on. I find it really exciting. Right. Um, right. Bees in the city, and I mean, I, mean, I mean, that sounds like a small thing, but there are many things happening that I, I mean, we should maybe open the discussion up to the younger people in the audience, but what do you, what do you feel? How optimistic do you feel the future is, and how do you see your relationship to architecture and the discussions about the environment. I'd be interested to know from some of the younger, younger people. <laughs> or to rephrase it, what was the most stupid thing we said? <laughs> well, I'm very inspired by um, like thinking about Armageddon and yeah. taking it as a prop to build more. Yeah. <laughs> But I'd like to thank you. I think we, we've run over time, and ah. I'd like to thank you so much for your talk and your discussion. Um, so we can't actually get questions from people, but I hope that the, the questions that you ask you know, do prompt everyone to think and that you know, we can talk about it again at other times over dinner, and maybe perhaps if you visit again. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, well, Thank you. <clears throat>
Um, also, thank you to the faculty, staff, and students who made this possible, um, kind of working behind the scenes. Um, we hope you'll join us on Thursday, November 10th at 6 p.m. for the Edward and Mary Allen lecture.